Yes, thank you guys uh, for the invite to give this talk. And uh, thanks to Phil and Renata for doing the hard work of outlining those main characteristics of supercontinents. So I'm going to take you from, I guess we've been looking in, in the deep mantle perspective, and we've been looking at the sort of surface reorganization of plates in Renata's talk. And I just want to focus here on this sort of earth surface effects of breaking a supercontinent up. And to, to do that, I want to give an example from the early Cenozoic North Atlantic uh, Igneous province, which is an area many of you will be familiar with. And this image here is a map of the uh, pharaohs um, from Sentinel. And the pharaohs consists of a really thick sequence of basaltic lavas in place around the time of the opening of the North Atlantic Igneous province. Um, so uh, just to give you a little bit of background, I don't want to talk too much about paleoclimate, but the context here in the North Atlantic is that it happened um, more or less uh, in sort of broadly contemporaneously with the uh, with the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum, which was um, one of the greatest uh, global warming events in Earth history, and certainly the, the greatest in the Cenozoic. This happened 56 million years ago, which is more or less precisely coincident with the around the time of the onset of the opening of the North Atlantic. Um, environmentally, what was going on, we had an increase in um, sea surface temperatures of about five degrees Celsius, um, ocean acidification, and also um, uh, a negative delta 13C excursion, which requires a big input of carbon into the system. Um, various people have used sort of um, chemical proxies in the ocean to attribute that to, uh, or to, to, to basically try to estimate how much carbon release it was. And the most recent estimates seem to be converging on around 10 to 15,000 gigatons of carbon uh, to the ocean atmosphere system. How did this all happen is the next question. And um, there have been various proposals, I guess, going back to the, the classic paper by uh, Henrik Svensson and his team. And they suggest that the carbon comes from mud rocks, which are effectively heated by the effects of magmatism at this time. So magmas effectively are intruded into sedimentary mud rocks and heat them up and that releases carbon. That actually releases a very light form of carbon uh, known as methane, which has a D13C signature of about minus 60, which is very, very light basically. Um, so uh, this is the sort of system they envisage. Each black dot on this map represents one of these vents, which is releasing methane effectively to the, to the atmosphere. However, um, Marcus Guchar and Gavin Foster and their group um, have looked at sedimentary constraints from this time, and uh, they model the uh, chemical characteristics of the sediments as uh, using Earth system models, and they actually suggest that actually the, the carbon entering the system was, was, was heavier and had a, a composition of around uh, minus 15, which is more consistent with volcanic inputs into the system rather than uh, mud rock uh, inputs or methane. So um, how do we tackle this, this problem? So I, I suppose what Guchar and people are saying is they're implicating the North Atlantic as a source of this. So we need to then test that model. And we test that model by actually computing the amount of carbon we should get, given what we know about this area. And so we do that using geotectonic models and we estimate the amount of carbon release from the ocean crust, which is unzipping at this time along this proto-northeast Atlantic. And we also add into that calculation the effects of large igneous provinces, and we estimate, we use existing estimates of um, emplacement rates of those. And what we get is actually a number which is about an order of magnitude too little um, to explain this carbon release. And that's the really intriguing kind of um, discrepancy, I guess, between what we kind of require and what we actually can infer based on the evidence. And it's also interesting to note that a lot of the magmatism in this the North Atlantic region is coincident with the Paleocene Eocene boundary. And also that the um, main peaks in seafloor magmatism post-date most of these environmental uh, catastrophes, effectively, these uh, hypothermal events. So um, the way to test that is to go to the rock record. So we investigated um, about 10 years ago, the uh, rock hole plateau, um, which was drilled in the 1980s. We re revisited some core. And what we find is a, a kind of an, an interesting increase in the uh, volcanism 
the number of a frequency of uh, volcanic tufts at this time during the PTM, which have interesting geochemical signatures, which suggest sort of a diversity of compositions um, located in and around the Greenland region. Do we see this more broadly in this region? The answer is yes. If we correlate this uh, sequence to the Faroe Islands in East Greenland, where I must stress the, the thickness of lavas being in place at this time are about 1.25 kilometers, so extremely uh, thick piles of lavas. And we see just precisely coincident with the PTM, we, we see a change in the composition to these high titanium basalts, similar to what we got in the Karoo in South Africa in the Jurassic. And these are consistent with high uh, liquidous uh, temperatures in the mantle, and they um, seem to require uh, a change in the mantle dynamics, more or less coincident with an error with the time of the PTM. So we can kind of, um, given that, we can then delve a bit deeper, and we do that using trace elements, using an approach developed by Godfrey Fitton's group, um, where we can actually estimate the percentage of the melting of the subcontinental uh, lithospheric mantle as we effectively stretch the North Atlantic um, plate at this time. And what's kind of really interesting is um, we see a stratigraphic upsection increase in the degree of melting, which actually peaks around the time of the PETM. So recall from the previous uh, plot that these little inverted triangles relate more or less around to the time of the PETM. So we're seeing an increase in the percentage of melting, um, typically between five and ten percent uh, melt. Uh, sorry, to five to ten percent melting of the subcontinental mantle at this time. It's a pretty short-lived phase, and uh, it's followed by um, typical normal mid-ocean ridge uh, basalt magmatism thereafter. So the question then becomes, what's going on? Um, and there's been a sort of a uh, a lot of studies in the last few years looking at the roots of the subcontinental mantle. Um, Paul Vusen in Science wrote a perspective on our paper, which was published in, in, in Nature Geoscience. And his description of cratons is that the, the base of them, it's like barnacles on the base, on the keel of a ship. You know, you get these carbonated regions which are stuck to the, uh, the lowermost subcontinental uh, lithosphere. And an idea is that when we extend the uh, lithosphere, that these are effectively taken out of their comfort zone. And in addition, we can take constraints from the Tanzanian craton today, where uh, Muirhead et al. have found that um, the carbon release rates effectively in the, in the rift are way higher than you would expect. And they've attributed the outgassing to lateral advection of this carbonated mantle which is supported by the existence of carbonatites as well in this region. So um, we then take this a step further then, and we try to estimate how much carbon we may be able to release, given that this is happening um, along the length of, of the rift, which is unzipping at this time. And we do this using uh, Monte Carlo simulations, and we effectively, um, we do these accounting for the uncertainty distributions, but we're effectively computing the length of the rift, the thickness of the subcontinental, uh, the carbonated region, which is pretty well constrained in this area, um, and also the extension rates. And this then gives us a typical carbon output for these uh, different degrees of melting, melting of this zone. And what's really interesting is that if we take these models, we can effectively generate um, enough carbon to account for the observed output during the PTM by having between four and 8% melting of the subcontinental mantle. And recall what we showed from petrology, which is that we, we have estimates between ranging between five and 10% uh, at this time, at precisely this time, which is a short lived phase um, and, a, and a fairly abrupt phase of magmatism as well. So just to summarize, this is our sort of conceptual framework then. If we tie together all of these observations, it seems that when we, when we stretch apart the uh, lithosphere beneath the North Atlantic region, potentially other cratons, we destabilize a region which is held in equilibrium. We um, effectively devolatize that. We remove the carbon from, the, from deep storage. 
and it effectively gets advected laterally into the asthenosphere where it's involved in decompression, and that will then ge generate enhanced melting. Um, it will uh, be picked up in the rock record, and we're starting to see evidence for that from, from the data that we've gathered. Um, but uh, similar, I guess, to what we see in East Africa today, we would expect to see a lot of this carbon being outgassed along sort of these uh, transcrustal structures as well. Um, so it's a, it's a very diffuse release, but it's a very rapid release of carbon that we expect from this process. So I, I will leave the model there and take any questions. Thanks, Tom. Excellent. So are there any Thanks, questions? Tom. Feel free to raise your hand or put them into the chat. Sasha? Yes. Thanks a lot, Tom. Great talk. Uh, the process of rifting and breakup is stretched out over many millions of years. Why is this uh, carbon excursion so short-lived? Yeah, so that's a good question. And um, the, the, the answer, I think, is, is to do with the, the period of time at which this carbonated keel, I guess, of the craton be, uh, ends up being extended. Because as you point out, the magmatism in this region actually started way earlier. We're talking about 61, 62 million years ago. So there's a kind of an inconvenient lag of about five or six million years between that starting and this happening. And the likely uh, answer is that it takes some time for these processes to generate or to destabilize this, this layer. So um, from, from the sort of the typical kind of models that we have um, have have developed here. Um, we 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 um, there's only I guess one instantaneous point in time where the along the length of the rift we are taking this um, probably 20 25 kilometer thick region and elevating it as we stretch the craton. So um, that's in terms of the time scales is pretty fits pretty well with the um estimated duration based on paleomagnetism in the Karoo, sorry in the Faroe Islands um this this period here is on the order of um 200,000 years which is actually remarkably similar to the duration of the PTM great thanks any further questions so Tom, I've got a question. Is there any observational evidence of this kind of mechanism happening um, you know, other, other times in Earth history? Like these rap, rapid, rapid outgassing of CO2 linked to rifting? That's a good question, Derek. Um, so the, the short answer is, I think when we go further back in time, we have less good geochemical proxy data. So we don't have the high resolution records, for example, in Rodinia breakup to be able to point, pinpoint these types of excursions. An implication of this would be that we might expect hypothermals even prior to really cold periods like Snowball Earth. But if we take the South Atlantic, which was earlier, we might expect that we, um, you know, the, the area Renata was discussing, we may expect this kind of process maybe to have happened. Um, and of course, this would have happened in the Cretaceous if that was the case. And the Cretaceous was punctuated by lots of short lived environmental events. Um, ocean anoxic events, which have been tied to enhanced uh, carbon outgassing. So it's, it's a possibility that needs testing, I think. Thanks.